Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday night Bible study with BereanNation.com on the channel on Twitch, Simul Justice at Peccator, which means at the same time, both sinner and justified. Actually, justified and sinner, but whatever. Uh, just with me on the call this evening is my friend, brother, and fellow elder, Alex. And Hello. what? what's up? We're good? Nothing. All yeah. right. So, we are expecting other people to show up. They show up when they, if and when they show up. And if they don't, well, that's okay. We're going to have a good time without them. Um, this week, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, before we do much else, I think we probably want to open in prayer, just because <laughs> that's the way it is with me. I can't remember myself to save my life. Maybe, Alex, I can get you to open in prayer for us. Okay. Uh, Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, and we ask that uh, you would open our eyes to your Word, and uh, that we would get a greater understanding of who you are through your Word, and uh, that you would Hello. edify us, and... Uh, Hi, <laughs> um, and uh, that that you would uh, um, uh, glorify your name at the same time, and uh, uh, we pray this in the name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My apologies about my timing. Hey, no worries. You got here, and that's kind of the point. Uh, as I said, we're in Second Corinthians chapter three this evening. Uh, let's sort of get a group read on the chapter so we can get it into our minds and know what we're talking about intelligently this morning. Uh, I make that this evening since it is after seven p.m. I was yeah. about to say hi there, Denikron. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. All right. <laughs> So, there are 18 verses. I think if we read six verses each, we will be able to accomplish our goal. 1 to 6, 7 to 12, and 13 to 18, yeah. Yeah, why don't you take first shift there, Dan, then uh, Alex, read second spot, and I'll clean it up. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just wanted to know, uh, how many how many verses? Six. Six, okay. So, 1 to 6, then you read 7 to 12, then Jerry will read okay. into 18. Yep. Okay. All right. The word of the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed what had glory in this case had no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory much more that which remain is in is in glory therefore having such a hope we use great boldness in our speech and are not like moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away but their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty." But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, 
uh, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Ah, okay, fair enough. Okay, sorry, I'm just... There we go! Ha! Ah, found the right buttons again. So, that's the chapter we're studying this evening. And what we do when we study the scriptures publicly like this is what's called chapter summary method. Perhaps you've heard of it as the inductive method of Bible study, where we ask ourselves three questions. First question is, what does the chapter say? I know it's a Bible study. It's kind of important to know what the chapter says. And so what we do is we summarize the chapter. We give ourselves, uh, you know, we break it into thought units according to verses because it's convenient. Then what we do is we give each of those breakdowns a summary title. And then we look for common themes throughout that. Give that an overall title, pick out a supporting verse that is key to our understanding of the chapter, so key verse, um, and that's the chapter uh, and as pertains to what it says. The second question is, well, if that's what the chapter says, what does that mean? Not, what does it mean to me? Because that is irrelevant, and besides, you know, nobody really cares what it means to Jerry, especially when they're trying to read it for themselves. Uh, don't ever take my word for anything I say. Check it out in the book, friends. What did God mean when he inspired, through the Holy Spirit, the men who wrote these books to write down what they wrote down? What did God mean when he said that? That's the second question. That can be harder to do, uh, especially if you're not a Christian, because if you are a Christian, Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and he is one of his jobs is to guide us into the truth. So if you don't have him, you don't have the advantage of basically a cheat sheet that gives you all the right answers. If you want that, we should talk later. So hang around afterwards. Anyway. The third question, there we go, got it upright. Third question uh, is, if that's what it says, and that's what God meant when he said that stuff, what am I going to do about it? What practical application can I extract and derive from the text? Um, this is where it can be a little more imaginative and creative, I suppose. Uh, sometimes it's a broad principle that you can see in the scripture, and it's very clear. And that's okay, because the Lord speaks to us about broad principles in his word. And sometimes it's, um, you know, very right down to the, the point and very specific. And that's okay, because the Lord points out very specific things to us in scripture as well. Um, either way, it comes from the Lord and not from our own understanding. We have to start with that as a presupposition when we study the scriptures. And that's how we do a chapter summary here at BereanNation.com. Now, uh, for all the folks that are on the call, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I can't see the screen at the moment. Um, who came with a chapter summary that they would like to share this evening? I'm going to need it out loud. Sorry, folks. Uh, I didn't finish one, but I have parts of one. Well, parts of one's better than no, and I, I got Alex in there too. Um, I'm trying to get to the... Okay, uh, Dan, why don't you start us off? Go ahead and share uh, share your thoughts with us. Uh, I divided it into four sections, verses 1 to 3, which I did not come up with uh, either a summary or a title for. Uh, verses 4 to 6, verses 7 to 11, and verses 12 to 18. Okay. Coincidentally, those are the divisions in the ESV, which I like so much, <laughs> but that's not entirely why I divided it that way. No, I understand. It's okay to do that, though, because uh, a lot of times that is the translator's uh, grouping, and there's some wisdom in that because they understand the Greek text way better than I do, that's for sure. Uh, incidentally, that breakdown follows the New American Standard paragraphing as well, so... 
Not that that means anything. It's just the point is, is two different sets of translators grouped it the same way. And that, that's significant. Go ahead. Please continue. So verses 4 through 6, I summarize with part of verse 5 as our sufficiency is from God. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, verses 7 through 11, I uh, summarize as our glory is from God. Uh, are you there? Yeah, just waiting yeah. for you to continue, brother. Trying not to oh. talk over you. Uh, and I summarize verses 12 to 18 as our hope is from God. Ah, okay. Okay. That's great. Did you have a, a particular meaning or want to talk about how that maybe spoke to your heart a little bit? Uh, this is, um, even from back when I was in Sunday school, this chapter always made me sit up and pay attention because this isn't just God doing it all. He leaves room for us in his work. That's the impression I always had of the chapter and have again rereading it this week. And I've always found that very uplifting, very exciting, very, mm -hmm. um, the good sort of challenging. It, it's, um, he doesn't just accept us to sit back and receive. He gives us opportunities. Right. This has always been one of the most exciting things about, about life overall and of Christianity within life higher up and further in. I could I could go on at great length, but I, I think I can leave it at that for now. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Dan, for sharing. Uh, Alex, go ahead with your uh, chapter summary. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, this is from Matthew Henry. Um, verses 1 to 11. Uh, the preference of the gospel to the law given by Moses and, ver and verses uh, 12 to 18. Uh, the preaching of the apostle was suitable to the excellency and evidence of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, verses 1 to 11. Even the appearance of self-praise and courting human applause is painful to the humble and spiritual mind. Nothing is more delightful to faithful ministers or more to their praise than the success, the, the, the success of their ministry, as shown in the spirits and lives of those among whom they labor. The law of Christ was written on their hearts, and the love of Christ shed abroad there. Nor was it written in tables of stone as the law of God given to Moses, but on the fleshly, not flesh, fleshly as fleshliness denotes sensuality, tables of the heart, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. Their hearts were humbled and softened to receive this impression by the new creating power of the Holy Spirit. He ascribes all the glory to God. And remember, as our whole independence is upon the Lord, so the whole glory belongs to him alone. The letter kills, the letter of the law is the ministration of death. And if we rest only in the letter of the gospel, we shall not be the better for so doing. But the Holy Spirit gives life spiritual and life eternal. The Old Testament dispensation was the ministration of death, but the New Testament of a life. The law made known sin and the wrath and curse of God. It showed us a God above us and a God against us, but the gospel makes known, makes known grace and Emmanuel, God with us. Therein the righteousness of God by faith is revealed, and this shows us that the just shall live by his faith. This makes known the great grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ for obtaining the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. The gospel so much exceeds the law and glory that it eclipses the glory of the legal dispensation. But even the New Testament will be a, a killing letter if shown as a mere system or form and without dependence on God the Holy Spirit to, to give it a quickening power. And verse 12 to, to 18 uh, it is a duty of the ministers of the gospel to use great plainness or clearness of speech. The Old Testament believers had only cloudy and passing glimpses of that glorious Savior, and unbelievers looked no further than the outward institution. 
But the great precepts of the gospel, belief, love, obey, are truths stated as clear, clearly as possible. And the whole doctrine of Christ crucified is made as plain as human language can make it. Those who live under the law had a veil upon their hearts. This veil is taken away by the doctrines of the Bible about Christ. When any person is converted to God, the veil, then the veil of ignorance is taken away. The condition of those who enjoy and believe the gospel is happy, for the heart is set at liberty to run the ways of God's commandments. They have light, and with open face that they behold the glory of the Lord. Christians should prize and improve these privileges. We should not rest content, contented without knowing the transformed power of the gospel by the working of the Spirit, bringing us to seek to be like the temper and tendency of the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and into union with him. We behold Christ as in the glass of his word, and as a reflection from a mirror causes the face to shine, the faces of Christians shine also. And that's my chapter summary. Praise the Lord. Okay. So um, I guess uh, just before we talk about what I saw in the chapter, um, I, I always like to give a little bit of review as to how we got to where we are. Um, this tends to get longer every week as we go through the book, right? But um, uh, having said that, um, I always like to start there because I think it kind of informs where we are and how we need to be looking at the words that Paul is using and what the Lord therefore is saying to us. And you'll, you'll recall that Paul was, you know, kind of not in the greatest, the mental states here. He was really put out in the extreme, I, I think to the point where it kind of began to distract him in his service for Christ. Um, after his second visit to Corinth, he was so saddened and deflated that he simply quietly left the city and returned to Ephesus. Um, and in Ephesus, he wrote what you'll recall is called the angry letter uh, that he sent and then wished he hadn't. Um, and I think this is where he began to get this distracted mindset. Uh, you know, that gnawing thing in your mind and your gut that you just basically, basically it makes you crazy until you can resolve it. Um, well, I, I wasn't there, but Paul was one of us. He was human. And it seems reasonable to me that he would have pretty average, normal human responses. So he was becoming so distracted that he basically, he left Ephesus because he had to know. So he left for Troas to look for Titus, who he had delivered the letter for him to Corinth. And it's entirely reasonable that Paul was after news of what happened uh, with that letter. Um, because if you think about it, it might have been kind of like a chink, shh, hand grenade tossed into the uh, the gathering there. And he was after news of what might have happened, to not knowing, right? And the wrinkle here is that when he got to Troas, he didn't find Titus. Uh, so he went, he, he's, you know, for the work there in Troas, he, he politely excused himself, I would believe. And he went looking for Titus in Macedonia. <laughs> so eventually he did find him, though, and he received a blessed report as to uh, everything that had happened with at least the majority of the people there being behind Paul and not the false teachers that were calling themselves, if you'll remember, super apostles. And you may note the use of air quotes because they were not. Um, but it was their job while they were there to try to attack Paul's character and bring him down so they could slide in, take over, and run the show themselves. Um, so what is the first thing that, you know, Paul has to face that. Paul has to, to meet that attack head on. So what's the first thing he does when he chooses to confront these people? Well, he confronts them with the idea of suffering and how suffering perfects the believer. Um, we talked about how this is actually what's going on in charismaticism today, where you have these guys that get in there and promise you that uh, God wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy for your whole life. And, you know, um, that's really not true because Hebrews chapter 11 ends with some very interesting words 
One of those words was destitute. Yeah, destitute. Specifically a financial word saying had no money. They lived in holes in the ground. There was another word that he used saying afflicted. That meant stricken with bodily illness. God doesn't command your health and wealth and happiness, brethren. He just doesn't. Okay, and we talked about how these false teachers were essentially trying to use the gospel, much like our, their modern counterparts, as a means of gain. And that's never good. Paul, on the other hand, wouldn't allow the Corinthians to support him while he was there. Um, we talked about how Paul had gone through real life-threatening trials for the sake of the gospel. Now, were any of these false teachers, he said, ever stoned for preaching the gospel? Not ever, but Paul was. Were any of them ever beaten with rods for publicly speaking about Christ? No, but Paul was. Um, and he was given 39 lashes on three different occasions. Um, one more stroke is a death sentence, if that interests you. Um, had any of them ever been shipwrecked or lost at sea? Well, Paul was for a day and for a night uh, for the sake of the work of Jesus on earth. No, beloved, suffering perfects us if we will cooperate with God and let it. What we saw was Paul talking about how the Lord had led him in real triumph. But it wasn't Paul's triumph, it was Christ's. Um, he speaks greatly here of his own motives in writing that angry letter and what that meant to the work, um, his own state of mind, the effect it had on the Corinthians like that. Um, it's sort of an apology in our modern sense, but it's also an explanation of why he wrote it. And this week in, in the chapter we're, we're studying, chapter 3, we're going to see the actual connection between the Old and the New Testaments, or covenants. Paul compares them in this chapter directly. Um, this is particularly crucial as an area of study, because if you get the covenants confused, or worse, ignore that one has gone before the other, you end up with some really whacked out ideas on things like tithing, resisting sin, stuff like that. So let's have a peek, shall we? I broke the chapter down as follows. I called it a new and spiritual reality. And I took verse 9 as my key verse. I'll read that for you. Verse 9 says, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. I broke it down as verses 1 to 3. You represent a new spiritual reality. Verses 4 to 6, we are servants of a new spiritual covenant. Verses 7 to 11, the new spiritual reality surpasses the old spiritual reality, or the old reality. Um, and verses 12 to 18, we should all live in the new spiritual reality. Now, of course, I have to define my terms a little bit before I start. Uh, the more we get into the silly narrative that liberal theologians of all stripes are engaging in today, the more I see a need for precision in the words I use when I speak. Um, I know that's really always been there, but it seems that these liberals have begun to redefine words and use them in ways that we do not. And they don't tell us that they did this, so they think they make it like they're talking about the same thing we are when they don't mean the same thing at all. Um, you know, hence the confusion with critical race theory and intersectionality. Um, this is an example. The word black is now being used to define those who are oppressed, regardless of their actual skin color, I might add. And the word white is being used to represent those who are the oppressors, again, regardless of the skin color in many, many respects. Now, beloved, I failed to receive that particular memo, okay? Uh, <laughs> sin since when has oppression really been defined by the concentration of a chemical called melanin 
in one's skin, the more you got, the darker you are. You know? Now, here's another question. In CRT slash I, why are red and yellow never mentioned? Or brown, in fact. Um, well, because, now please sit down if you're not already. It's because they're not needed. Okay? Now, as a, as a red man, uh, an identified red man, that makes me feel a little excluded. But not really, okay? Because this is such a man-made idea. Consider these two verses. The first one is, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him a renewal in which there is no distinction between the Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. That's the first verse. That's Colossians 3, verses 9 to 11. The second passage is this, For, all you, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28. There is no race except for the human race. And there are no ethnic distances or barriers of interaction. There are no social barriers, economic barriers, religious barriers, national barriers, or even sexual barriers. All of them have been overcome overwhelmingly by Christ in his coming kingdom, of which rules we are to live by and obey now in the present. We have what I'm calling a new spiritual paradigm as set up by Christ and set out by the Holy Spirit according to the will of God the Father. We have a new spiritual reality. And please, I invite you to check Webster's Dictionary for the definitions of the words I'm using. So, I took uh, verse 9 as my key verse. I called it a new and spiritual reality. Verse 9 again reads, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. And I picked it because it really plays the two covenants off against each other. The old covenant, the ministry of condemnation, and the new covenant, the ministry of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. We'll cover that. Okay. Verse 9 is kind of like a watershed sort of verse. Uh, where you land on the topic of the covenants will determine, in large part, how you view the rest of Scripture. Uh, pure dispensationalists, for example, often don't know how to preach through the Old Testament and make it Christian Scripture, for example. Just saying. Now, um, that's because they don't recognize that there are lasting elements to all the covenants. Um, and they often just say something like, yes, but now we're under the new covenant, and that should be our focus. And while that's correct, do they know why they can say that? Most of them, I would argue, no. Guys like Dr. MacArthur, he certainly does, but he's the exception, really, that proves the rule. Um, the reason, just for the record, and for you gents here, is because of Christ. That's why we can say the new covenant is a better covenant. Um, in fact, if you read through the Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, rather, um, you'll see that that new covenant is really a better everything. Um, but it's Christ that defined all of the covenants in the first place. Okay? 
covenantal theologians often focus too much on which covenant the passage is referring to. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, for example, well, that's the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, you know, uh, Genesis chapter 11, well, that's the Noahic covenant. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, well, that's the Adamic covenant. Technically, it's not, but uh, the Adamic covenant wasn't actually a covenant. It was a set of rules that were dictated by God as to how things were supposed to work. But, uh, you know, uh, you want to get into first. First Samuel and Second Samuel, that's that's the Davidic covenant. And you know, all of these covenants are completed in Christ. Um if it can't be seen in the new covenant, well then they tend to ignore the passage, and that's not really an answer to this either. Okay. The only thing to me that makes any real sense at all is to read it carefully, the scriptures I mean, and ignore your own presuppositions. Um, we have in Christ a new spiritual reality, and that at least should be reflected in our teaching and in our behavior and in our worldview. Um, and if it isn't, then I suggest that you may need to repent and believe the gospel. Um, and what is the gospel? Very simply, it is that God the Son, at the behest of God the Father, became human by means of a virgin birth, and then after living a perfect and holy life under the law of Moses, or the Old Covenant, in obedience to the Father, he willingly and knowingly gave up his life, so that he could substitutionarily or vicariously, if you like, pay for the sins of all those who would ever turn to him in faith there on a Roman cross through all of time and space. Friends, such love demands a response. Um, we either ignore it and procrastinate ourselves into hell for eternity, or we can turn in repentance of the things that we know are wrong uh, anyway, and believe that he really did die to pay the penalty for those sins, and that he rose again on the third day to show this to the rest of the world. And if you believe that, then look, please, let us know, because we can send you resources that can help that. Or if you're local here to Ottawa, we'd love to have a cup of coffee with you. I mean, pandemic being what it is. We could at least talk over the, the internet or the telephone. But it's at this point I want to jump into the text this evening um, where Paul begins to expound the virtues, really, of both covenants and tells us how we are really in a whole new reality and paradigm. So verses 1 to 3, you represent a new spiritual reality. Now Paul takes up the analogy of a written letter as an analogy here to demonstrate to the believers in Corinth that they have really been translated into a new and spiritual reality and no longer live in, an, in the old reality. Um, I know it's very rem rem reminiscent of that same kind of old nature, new nature conversation that we've had for many, many uh, years in the past, and how Paul calls us really to walk in the Spirit and not that old fleshly system which governs the world still. Um, so let's peek into the text and get a picture of what Paul means. Verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? So Paul takes up his argument, asking his customary rhetorical style questions, um, and let me remind everyone that every part of Scripture has a context. And for context here, we look at the immediately preceding text. There, Paul was saying that he was not peddling the Word of God, and that's an actual quote. He was not some used car salesman doing a con job on people. He was being sincere in his words and in his intentions as one who is turning on all the lights to show people the truth. After such a statement, though, he asks, 
do we need to give you our qualifications all over again? He then proceeds to ask rhetorically, do we need letters of commendation again? Do we need to produce them for you? Or perhaps you're wanting to write them for us. <laughs> you know, you, you may recall the tradition of writing a letter to vet the brother that's visiting another gathering. You know, Paul is rhetorically asking if all that's really necessary. Um, you folks uh, who follow how logic statements and arguments work will recall that when a question is asked rhetorically, the answer is actually obvious from either the tone or the wording of the question. Clearly here Paul's saying, well, let's not go down this road again. Verse 2. You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by men. He then says, you are our letter. Okay, In what appears to be a sudden change of direction, Paul says, we don't really need to produce a letter because you are our letter. Remember the purpose of those letters? It was to introduce and assure people in the destination gathering that this was a good brother and that he could be trusted in the faith and it was okay if he could get up and preach and all of that. You know, Paul is equating the Corinthians as his letter of proof. You are my letter, says Paul. You are my proof that I have been faithful to my calling in Christ. Moreover, he continues, you are written in my heart and you are read by all men. You ever heard that phrase, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads? That's the kind of thing Paul is saying here. I, I take issue with that particular statement, but it's an example of what Paul was saying. The truth of my commendation and my faithfulness to God is seen by all in you and in your faith. Imagine someone being able to say something like that about you, friends. Think about it for a second. Verse 3, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You know, even better, Paul tells the Corinthian believers that they were a letter written by Christ, no less. <laughs> And those believers were cared for by the workers in and about Corinth. Timothy, Apollos, uh, Prisca and Aquila, Silvanus, uh, all those were involved in the spiritual care of Corinth. Stephanus and his household, uh, and others. And Christ wrote the letter, not with ink, but with the very Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit. Now, now comes the comparison between the Old Covenant, written by the finger of God on two stone tablets, versus the New Covenant. So the Old Covenant, like I said, it was written by the finger of God on two stone tablets. And what are those what did those tablets contain? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Okay, it contained the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> yeah, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I'm, you, you, I'm sorry, you got to be on the ball, brother. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, the ten, no worries. I was, at, I was just looking at... <gasps> you weren't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, it was the sorry. Ten Commandments. It was the moral law of God. Okay? Um, they first told us how we're to relate to God. There are four specific commandments for that. And then there are six on how we relate to others. Yeah. So, what others? All others. Okay? And, and we know this because you will not covet your neighbor's fill-in-the-blank stuff, I guess. Um now, remember who Jesus said your neighbor was? Basically everybody. Um, but this letter that Paul is talking about 
with the Corinthians was not written on stone tablets. Instead, this same moral code is written on the tablet of the hearts of believers with the Holy Spirit. This is, by the way, the very reason that we can say that a changed life should mark the life of a believer. He should have a new set of priorities because he has a new heart that has God's law written on it by the Holy Spirit personally. And that Holy Spirit changes our nature so that we not only desire to, but we proceed to walk with Him. And it was written by Christ when He rose from the grave, beloved. Now, maybe you're sitting there saying to yourself, I've never heard this before. Well, then I'll tell you, uh, yeah, I'll tell you that it's time you heard it, my friend. Um, you need to come to Him by the way that he has made for us, and accept the fact that he paid for your sins. Leave those old things behind. Become a new person, like he wants for you. And he's not going to leave you alone. He brought you here. And we can help. Because we care for you, just like Paul cared for the church at Corinth. Email me or open a chat. Say something in the chat. I won't answer personally at the moment because I'm busy here, but we have people in there that can answer your questions. Shoot me an email, pastorjer at outlook.com. I'll be happy to answer. Talk to one of the guys that's here. They are prepared and able to help you. You see, if you've come in humility and repentance for your wrongdoings, you represent the very new and spiritual reality that Christ died and rose again to initiate when he came the first time. And he's coming again to bring those who are his to himself to be with him forever. And that should be comforting and incredibly uplifting and edifying if you're genuinely his. Otherwise, it might terrify you. So that brings me to my next sort of uh, thought unit. Verses 4 to 6, we are servants of a new spiritual covenant. Now back to the text, although we didn't really leave it. Um, Paul is writing these things to show just how he cared for Corinth. Um, and the best way to do this, that's care for Corinth, was to tell them the truth. Um, and we can gather blessing and encouragement from what he said also. So let's look. Verse 4. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Now Paul, after touching all the glories of the Mosaic Covenant, and how Christ did even better with the New Covenant for his people, um, he explains that this is the reason that he and all the others have helped from outside Corinth, and how really they have this kind of confidence and boldness to teach and speak and live in Corinth the way that they do. This confidence doesn't come from bold personality or gregariousness or the ability to make friends or even great oratory skill. It comes from Christ, and it comes from Christ alone. He's the only reason that Paul and we could and can have confidence to war toward God concerning, well, anything, really. Um, verse 5, Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. See? Now, Paul knew that it didn't come from those external things, or training, or other such silliness. Um, it simply didn't come from himself. And he speaks in the plural, so we can include all the worker people that help from outside Corinth, like Timothy or Apollos, or inside Corinth, like Stephanus and his household. There was no adequacy found in any of them. And beloved, I get it. 
There's no adequacy found for this in me either. I know it. I feel the lack of it every time we put on one of these studies, honestly. Um, or a podcast, or a movie watch party. Um, I'm completely inadequate for this task in my own strength. Well, praise God for the next phrase. Our adequacy is from God. And beloved, there is nothing that he cannot do. And we serve him. Verse 6. Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. See, it is this God that makes us adequate to serve Him. We are servants of His spiritual new covenant. Um, he even talks about how this new covenant is better in this verse. This covenant is not of the letter, says Paul. That was the old covenant. Okay, It was a collection of rules that were intended to govern the behavior of those that were under it. It was concerned with the exacting details of every, well, uh, yacht and tittle, okay? Uh, the smallest elements of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, every yacht and tittle of that law, given by God to Moses for the people of Israel, all to set them apart. The law wasn't evil, it wasn't bad. And I know sometimes I tend to think of it that way. It's like, oh, it's the law. You're under the law. The law was a good thing. It was given by God, beloved. Now, what do we know about the law? Well, Hebrews 10 verse 4 tells us that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. Romans 2.17 tells us that the law can only condemn and put to death. Romans 8.3 tells us that the law was weak through the flesh and could not accomplish redemption. So God did it himself. Christ died to save us. God the Son, the second person of the triune God. Now why am I taking the time to establish this? Because in the text here in this verse, Paul says that the letter of the law kills. It is the Spirit, capital S, here in, the, in this verse, okay, that gives life. So, really, when you see the capital S, you say to yourself, Holy Spirit, in your head. Okay? Why? Well, because when we finally turn to Him in repentance and faith, He gave us a new heart, right? Um, one with the law of God already written upon it, and a desire to please God and to do the things that were written on our hearts by Him. Yeah? Beloved, it's all done in God, and this is part of our salvation. We are foreknown by Him. We are foreordained, or predestined, if you like, to be His Son, or to be like His Son. We're called, we're justified, and we're glorified, even if that part hasn't happened yet. It is a completed work, a done deal, and we serve Him. And he has made us adequate. And we can be adequate no other way. No matter how hard we try to live in our own strength and wisdom. You know, I hear smart men say stupid things. Or I hear them pick on irrelevant points. Or I hear them nitpick about things for irrelevant reasons. I can do that myself. We are nothing outside of Him. He makes us adequate. But why should this matter to us? Why should we care? Well, that's the next thought unit. Verses 7 to 11, the new spiritual reality surpasses the old reality. Well, because this new and spiritual reality is infinitely better, than what went before, no matter how much we may have liked what went before, it's still better, and it's still beyond, and it's still current, okay? 
And, and look, there are reasons the old actually appeals to us. Um, it was uh, a set of rules that we could follow so we didn't have to figure out how to do it for ourselves. And that that's a lot of work and it takes discipline. And to be honest, who likes doing that? You know, um, you know, we, we could use it as a basis of, of comparison with others to make ourselves feel superior according to imagined or arbitrary measures. And, and beloved, it gets much darker from there if I go on. Uh, so I'm going to leave off with that analysis, but it's not really the point. The point is to show the superiority of the new and spiritual reality. Let's look at the text. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was. And that's where the verse stops. It's not where the thought stops, but that happens sometimes. Um, basically, to show the vast superiority of the new spiritual reality, Paul is not mocking the old system as we tend to do, or, or maybe I should rephrase that, as I tend to do. Um, but look, I've heard a lot of other guys, including some of you, do the same thing. So forgive the generality. Um, instead, he simply explains what it was. Uh, it was, in his words, the ministry of death, or the ministry of condemnation. Uh, in other places in his epistles, including the last verse of this very chapter, Paul says that the letter of the law of Moses kills, but the Holy Spirit gives life. I recognize that really it's only one way of looking at this, but all the other ways of looking at this are actually kind of similar. Um, the old system causes death. The new reality is what gives life. Why exactly is that? Well, it is. It's because this shows the standard of what was right and what was wrong. And it was literally written in stone. Okay? And it was beautiful, and it was perfect, friends. And I've read it, and there are no contradictions in it, and there are no overlays that you can impose on it legitimately. It stands on its own, like that. But in its beauty, it was, and still is, absolutely deadly. Um, and it's inflexible in that there is no wiggle room or uncertainty. Let's take an example. Um, it says, you shall not steal. If you steal, you have broken the law. It, it doesn't examine your motives. It doesn't consider the circumstances, mitigating factors, nor does it consider the degree of theft or the impact. Uh, this is sort of a theoretical, but if I stole a dollar from the cash register where I actually work in a flooring store to pay for a cup of coffee because I was falling asleep at the desk, the boss wouldn't have said that I did anything wrong when he found out about it. And I probably would have told him myself, oh yeah, I took a dollar out of the till to go buy a coffee. That's how I would have said that, you know. But I had, the, I had no intent to return it, so technically it's theft. Okay, and the law says that I'm guilty. Because I didn't ask ahead of time to get clearance for it. Um, now, if I stole a dollar from a guy that was hard up for cash, and needed every penny, say, for home repair, um, I'd say he'd miss the dollar and his roof might continue to leak. Um, and I'd still be guilty. And the law says that in either case, I must atone and then make it right. And, it, and in fact, I have to make it better than right by five times. You know, depending on where you're looking for what offense, I know, but nevertheless, it is the law of God. And it's glorious because of that. In fact, when God gave that moral law, the great Decalogue, as some theologians call it, the Ten Commandments to Moses, and Moses brought it down from the mountain, the scriptures say that his face shone with the glory of God. 
Well, actually, let's look at that. That's in Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 and 30 say, It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him, that is, God speaking with Moses, or Moses speaking with God. Depends where you put the capital H there. Um, so when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Now later it tells us that he had to wear a veil over his face to hide the glow because it was freaking people out. Okay, um, And that included Aaron, the high priest, Moses' older brother. <laughs> uh, you know, it can be clearly said that there was a heavenly glow, a heavenly glory to the old covenant, the law of Moses, given by God himself, and written in stone by God's own hand. And Paul said that glory was fading. Because eventually, Moses stopped glowing. Verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be with even more glory? Then Paul poses a real question. It's rhetorical, meaning that the answer to the question is obvious from the question itself. How can the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, fail? to give more glory than that, the old. Well, it really can't, can it? It's not really a question, I suppose, but... No, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify the person that Christ has justified by faith in Him. First, He, the Holy Spirit, comes and takes up residence in that person. And He begins to clean house changing our personalities into the image of Christ, all while leaving our individuality intact. <laughs> Go figure. That is, he, he sanctifies us as we choose to walk with Christ day by day, especially when the going gets rough. Now, how glorious is that? And it has no real relation to the law, except that he has changed our characters to prioritize that moral law which he has written on our hearts. Now that can take a long time, but he is doing it. And also that we may stand before Christ on the day that he judges us and hear those wonderful, immortal words, well done, good and faithful servant. Imagine that. Verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. You know, if that first covenant is filled with the glory of God, how much more is the second? Beloved, we're no longer under that old covenant. We've accepted for ourselves, by faith, the rule of the new covenant. And it is the covenant that leads directly to salvation through Christ. And I would further argue that faith in Messiah really has always been the true path of salvation for man. We can see it from the very beginning. Right there in the beginning parts of Genesis, all the way to the last few verses of Scripture, where the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse seven, uh, 22, verse 17. And this is the promised Messiah speaking these words. And Messiah, Christ, that is, God the Son, Jesus, is actually referring to Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 3, which says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, 
And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in abundance. Incline your ear to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant for you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. I tell you, Isaiah longed to know what that was about. The angels longed to look into these things. Um, you know, it says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. They all see the glory which fills the new covenant and they want to understand what's in it and why it's better. And we, beloved, we are privileged to know it firsthand if we will repent of our sins and believe that he is the one who saves us from death by his own death, burial, and resurrection on the third day later. Verse 10, For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. This is what Paul is saying. He explains that the old covenant, the law, was filled with glory. It was the very word of God, written to man in his own hand. And the new covenant is also the word of God. But the difference between the two isn't based on the word. Both are the word. The difference is that Christ, the personification of God himself, died for all of us as the suffering Messiah in the old to redeem us to himself as the living God of the new. Now, it has so much more glory that it is as if the law, by comparison, had none at all. So, glory of the old covenant. Very, very, very much glory. Compared to the glory of the new covenant. is a little bit that much. See the point? That's glory. Verse 11. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Remember, Moses' face eventually stopped shining. The law became so compromised by men that it was no longer effective. So Christ gave himself and offers all of that to all of us if we will accept it for our own. Now, let me ask, is that something you want? Because if it is, you can have it. Just acknowledge those things you hate yourself for doing. Acknowledge that those things are wrong. They're sin before God. And accept that Jesus paid the price for those wrongdoings when he died on the cross, according to the scriptures, and prove the same when he rose from the dead also according to the scriptures. And, and beloved, not to put too fine a point on this, but the Lord is coming back. No matter which shade of rosy colored glasses you might look uh, through to interpret the scriptures, all the main ones agree that Christ is returning. Making that offer of repentance through faith in Christ a limited time offer. Don't let time run out on you. You risk much if you play that game. Verses 12 to 18. We should all live in that new spiritual reality. You see, we should all live in that new spiritual reality of the new covenant. It's the one that preaches direct salvation in Christ. And it really always has been the way of salvation, like I said. Um, even before he entered into earthly time and those verifiable historical events that played out in real time. 
And if we will not, then we are choosing not to yield the ground to him. And he will take it away from you on that day. Or we can choose now to yield it to him. And, and have him bless it. And give, a, give it to us as our own. For real, someday. We need to live in the light of reality, the new and spiritual reality. This is what I mean. Verse 12. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Yeah. So here, Paul starts to draw practical application regarding everything he has declared. He's saying in modern language, because we have this new and spiritual reality in which to place our hope, we are to speak reality to people. Okay, We don't use types and shadows or euphemisms anymore. We say things plainly, not hiding the light that Christ is shining through us. See, here he talks about how Moses used to have to cover up the light just so people could look at him when he spoke. That, says Paul, is no longer necessary or even advisable. Um, now, I see the guy there in the back row of the internet waving his hand like Arnold Horshack from the 1970 sitcom. <laughs> Welcome back, Cotter. Ow, ow, ow! <laughs> I, I see you. Here's his question. But what if we get pushback? What then, Mr. Kata? Well, you need to learn how to push back persuasively. Now, what does that mean? Alex, I see your hand waving that you have a question. Write it down. We'll, uh, we'll answer all of this stuff at the end, okay? Um, well, it, it means that this is where you become a teacher, showing people the way things really are. You speak the plain truth unvarnished, but you do it with patience and long-suffering because not everybody is going to agree with you, at least maybe not right away. Um, it's your job to bear with them, Christian. It isn't your job to thump down on them with your big Bible. And we all have at least one of those, okay? It's your job to live your faith in front of them and to live in reality, speaking the truth because you love them and bearing with them patiently when they disagree. Don't be intimidated and don't be backed down by bullies. Live fearlessly, beloved. A great example uh, of a Canadian uh, that does this is actually a politician. Uh, his name is Derek Sloan. You know, when he was running for uh, the recent leadership of the Conservative Party, his motto was conservative, unapologetically. Um, but he wouldn't argue if there was no point. He would state his case, and he would restate it until he could get people to see the truth. Now, I know he's a politician, but he's also a believer. <laughs> you know, he gets this. Uh, he met James Coates, incidentally. Um, it's, it's on video. I've seen it. Um, but besides, the brightness of the light that we can shine on, what is the... Basically, we it's like we have this big spotlight. And there's something that's right. Flick it, switch. Shine it. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay? The brightness of that light really speaks for itself. Okay? People don't like it. Because generally speaking, people aren't doing what's right. They're doing what's wrong. Um, but to be fair, that's not anything Jesus didn't warn us about. Men hate the light because their deeds are evil, it says in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. You know, don't be shocked when this happens to you. They don't want to be exposed. You know, you didn't like it either. And we still deal with our own fleshly self on a daily basis besides. You know what it's like. Have mercy and compassion, but let your light shine and speak the unvarnished truth. Verse 13. And are not like Moses, 
who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Now, that's an interesting thought. Okay, uh, we looked at the text in Exodus 34 uh, in the last section, but it kind of bears repeating because uh, this that particular text is a place that it tells us that that the people of Israel have Moses put a veil over his face, basically so he wouldn't freak them out. Um, but it bears repeating here that Paul is saying we are not like Moses. Okay, sometimes the way we live will freak people out, and I believe that's of God. I think it's God's intent to shock them out of their spiritual stupor so that they can see the glory of God and give them their opportunity to either accept or refuse what he offers in terms of salvation through Christ alone. Now, I know some of my Calvinist brethren will have problems with the way I phrased that, but frankly, I don't care. And I'm going to explain why. You know, it says in the Westminster Confession of Faith, in chapter 3, paragraph 1, uh, I will quote, God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so, as thereby neither God is the author of sin, here's the critical part, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. It is the emphasized portion of that says that just because God made all the plans before the world was formed, it does not say or mean anywhere that mankind has no choice in his own eternal destiny or destination. No violence is offered to the will of the creatures. They will choose what they want, and they will be rewarded eternally and accordingly. The London Baptist Confession of Faith in 1689 says the same thing, although it adds extra little bits in that paragraph, but that particular phrase occurs in both confessions. The Westminster Confession notes that this phrase comes from James chapter 1, verse 13 and 17, and 1 John uh, 1, verse 5. So we're going to look at those for the record. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 13 and 17. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Now, what this is saying is, God is not going to drag people kicking and screaming into his kingdom. He's going to ask. And because I think he loves us, he's going to offer you the opportunity to accept it. And if you don't, that's fine with him. Somebody's got to make up the reprobate population. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but that's the reality. Now, uh, 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. You cannot accuse God of being unfair. He is light. He is the Lord of all. He is responsible for everything's existence. It is still perpetually going because of his power. You cannot say that he is unfair. You cannot. Because it just isn't correct. Now, all of this is to say that man has a choice, okay? I'm not going to start a debate here about libertarian free will and Arminianism, okay? Um, because that's clearly error, okay? So, some, some will actually even say heresy. Um, I might even be one of them if we're talking about extreme Arminianism. Uh, but very common today, 
in the realm of Christendom is Arminianism and decisional Christianity, okay? Um, and please note um, that it's Christendom. And you can note the use of air quotes there because I'm not talking about what the scriptures talk about when it talks about what real Christianity and believers are, okay? Because the doctrines of grace are still preserved even if humanity has a will of its own, okay? If they will decline the choice to live, that is their right, and it is given by God. If they choose life instead, then God welcomes home his prodigal child. That isn't what this statement is strictly about. But it's important that we understand that each person has a right to make his own decision. God's will is done in any case, all to show his glory to the universe, even if we don't fully understand it. So what's the real purpose of the veil Moses wore? Well, it was so they wouldn't see the glory on Moses' face fade. Yeah. Eventually, Moses stopped glowing. But that's no longer the case. We now have and are supposed to live in the light of the permanent glory of Christ. Now, there's more about this in the next verse. But just before I leave this uh, consideration, like I said, it's not really my intent to start a debate on what I would actually call the heresy of Arminianism, or the remonstrance, as it were. But sometimes the languages that we use have limitations. And I think sometimes this is one of them. Moving on. Verse 14. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. Okay, Paul, Paul's explaining the connection here, okay? Uh, those who follow the Old Covenant, as glorious as it was, have let the New Covenant pass them by. Because as he says here, their minds have been hardened. The Greek word for hardened is porao, and it defines a making hard or a callousing over, a uh, a petrifying, if you will. Um, now, the verb itself is in what's called the aorist tense. Most of those are translated as a simple past tense. Uh, their minds were, their minds were hardened, or their minds were parao. Okay, I tend to see some of these though as better translated as past perfects, and this is one of those cases. Their hearts were hardened at a starting point and are still hardened in the present. Both are true. But what it tells us is that when the law is read, that veil is still unlifted and they still do not see. And by the way, that is why I prefer the past perfect tense. Because they need to turn to Christ in faith to have that veil lifted. Now, that's one of the results of being justified in Christ, and it gets easier and better and more clear as he continues to sanctify us. Uh, I believe it will be perfected when he finally glorifies us when we enter the eternal state, uh, or perhaps the millennial reign. Okay, I, I am premillennial in my eschatology, so uh, i kind of undecided on that, and I'm not sure it's really important. So there you go. Um, but beloved, this is important. We cannot understand the law or its purpose apart from Christ. We cannot understand the Old Covenant apart from the New Covenant, no matter what the new Marcionists like Andy Stanley have to say. The God of the Old Covenant is the God of the New Covenant. And if you don't see that, then you know what? Stick around and, as they say in another kind of group meeting, keep coming back, okay? I'll try to keep explaining it simply and intelligently as long as you want me to do so. Verse 15. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Now, here's Paul. Paul is explaining something. 
Uh, pardon me just for a moment. Sorry, I got a head cold. The medication really drives me out. Okay, so Paul, what Paul is explaining here is what modern ecumenicists miss, okay? We are not New Covenant Jews, okay? We are followers of Jesus, first called Christians at Antioch, and believe me, it wasn't a compliment. Um, we share their Old Covenant book, the Torah, along with their prophets and their wisdom writings, commonly called the Tanakh, when all collected together. We call it the Old Testament. And by the way, it contains no apocryphal books in the Hebrew. So no Romanish translations of scripture. And that's important, okay? Um, these are the Jewish scriptures. It's what the apostles referred to for the most part when they talked about the scriptures or the word of God in the New Testament. It's the only scriptures they had available to them then. That's what they used. Okay, but when a Jewish person reads those scriptures, or when it's read to them, Paul says a veil lies over their heart, not the physical cardia, but the spiritual center of understanding and decision making. A veil lies over that. Okay, um... And that's his fancy way of saying, they just, look, they just don't understand it. And they can't, because they will not turn to Christ. Beloved, get this right. The Bible, all of it, Old and New Testaments, are the Christian scriptures. Jude says it like this, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. What saints would Jude have been referring to? How about all of them? From Adam and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right through to Dan and Alex and Jerry, and maybe beyond that. Just because it shares a common base with Jewish scriptures does not mean we have to buy into their traditions and festivals and feasts and system of laws and be circumcised on the eighth day and all that stuff. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Hebrews 8.13 says that he has made the first covenant, that is the law of Moses, obsolete. Jews and Christians are not on the same path. Not at all. Judaism is the religion of the Pharisees and Sadducees that Jesus rejected when he was here the first time. Classical Judaism, on the other hand, ends in Christianity. Whatever Shylocks like Jonathan Kahn try to tell you about Jewish stuff, like the Shemitah, whatever, it's irrelevant to Christianity. We don't need to become more Jewish in our understanding of Scripture. What we need to do is understand what God wrote through the men that he anointed by the Holy Spirit and had write all the pages of the 66 books that he ordained. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 put it like this, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All we need is the Bible, beloved, and the Holy Spirit to help us understand it when we read it. In fact, that's why we have these studies. Um, yeah. So that's what we should be doing about it. I, I don't study the scriptures any differently if I'm studying them for private uh, study or edification or for public sharing like I'm doing right now. Beloved, don't have a veil over your heart. We're all here to understand. Let's help each other do that. You know, I learned from all of you, too.
<laughs> I, I really do. So come with a study prepared. Look, you'll get to share it. We, we proved that tonight. Moving on. Verse 16. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You see, this is what Paul taught. Turn to Christ in reality, and you will begin to understand the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit will guide your understanding of the words that are used, and it will He will help you to apply those words to your life in meaningful ways and to your situations. Okay, And then you can act with knowledge of the will of God and gain wisdom as that knowledge is put into practice. And this isn't some airy-fairy, mystical, meditative garbage, beloved. It's very real. Now, I need to say a word about what this is not. This is not navel-gazing, New Age crapola. Okay? Which, by the way, is actually in my spell checker, and it has one P, not two, like I had originally written it. Go figure. Um, anyway, it's, it's not sitting very quietly, trying to hear, hear a still, small voice. You know, like came to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, verse 12. You know how I know that? Because, beloved, that's the only place that phrase is ever used in Scripture. <laughs> okay? But, but I guess it sounds good, so the charismaniacs grabbed it and doctrinalized it. See, I can make up words, too. Um, because they could get the fish to bite on it's my guess. You know, hey, hey, look, I, I bought into it for years, even after my unceremonious exit from Charismania, okay, because I thought it was biblical. Uh, well, it isn't. H heck, even John Piper believes it, okay? Uh, or rather, huh? or, or rather, wouldn't discount it. Um, you know, uh, let me read, let me read what, it, what he said. Um, he said, and even though the glory and majesty of God in his word <clears throat> can be known in the still small voice of whispered counsel beside the bedside of a dying saint, there is something in it that cries out for expository exaltation. Uh, he gave that in a lecture called John Calvin, the man in his preaching. That's in the final paragraph of his message to the 1997 Bethlehem Conference for Pastors. Yes, I read too. Um, now look, I'm not a big fan of John Piper for a number of reasons. Um, but he has some stuff that's decent, and, and I think this is one of those things. He, he clearly sees the still small voice bit, and he fell into the trap. Beloved, that was for Elijah. That's not how God speaks to us. God doesn't whisper. In fact, there's a book written uh, with that title. God doesn't whisper. Um, anyway. In fact, if you look through the New Testament, which I recommend you do, sometimes you do see the giving of visions and, and things like that. Uh, okay, but these events are specific and rare. And they're confined largely to the capital A apostles. Augustine, by the end of the 4th century, had the opinion that these gifts had ceased with the death of the last apostle. Now, does that mean God doesn't work that way? No, God can do whatever he wants. He's God. But we shouldn't expect it. We should instead seek to know his word, brethren, where his will is recorded for us or at least the general principles for living in a broken world system that can inform us to make intelligent choices about reality and not be befuddled by the confusion going on out there, wherever that is. Let's look at Hebrews 1 for a minute. Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 to 4 read, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. 
and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. Now, if you will recall when we studied Hebrews, we looked at this passage. We kind of had to. It's in the first bit of text. Okay? And we saw that the translation into English here somehow loses something in translation in terms of strength of passage. Okay? Remember, God placed the veil over the hearts of his own people to keep them from a full understanding of his word because of the stubbornness of their sinfulness. And we should take caution at that, by the way. Okay, what this is actually trying to convey involves that. And it is verse 1 that God spoke long ago to the leaders of Israel through the prophets in little bits and pieces here and there through many prophets with many words and prophecies with the general understanding that it was so they couldn't put it all together because of his judgment on them. Verse 2, has in these last days spoken, that is spoken his will, to us in his Son. That's Jesus, the Christ of God identified to us by multiple witnesses through history, including extra-biblical sources like Josephus. He spoke to us literally in son, is what the Greek says, but that is generally understood uh, to mean in English in the person of his son. Everything he said and everything he did while he was here the first time, everything he was, both God and man, this son, God appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, beloved. The son was the actual creative force that made everything. Shades of John 1, yes? Now, verse 3, this son is the exact representation of God's holy nature. And this son literally holds everything together by the word of his power. Folks, the universe, have you seen the size of it? The scale? The magnitude? From the smallest subatomic particle to the largest star at the greatest distance from us possible and beyond. He holds it all together. And he had the time to come and mess around here for 33 or 34 years? <laughs> yeah. You know, beloved, that son. <laughs> okay? And when, not if, he had cleansed the sins of those who would turn to him throughout history, because time is also a dimensional variable in play here, he sat down. Why? Well, it was because he was tired and needed a break. No, beloved. Okay, it was because the work he started in Genesis was now completed insofar as believers needing to be redeemed. If you grew up on a farm, you might have an understanding of this. You basically get to sit down when all the work is done. Okay? Though we need it, he doesn't. And where did he sit down? Right beside the Ancient of Days, the King of the Ages, God the Father, on his throne. And he adds a bit here about how he is so much better than the angels, one in particular, I think, because he has inherited, catch that, inherited a better name than they. He didn't even earn it. He didn't need to do any of this. But he did. Praise his holy and awesome name. 
Beloved, we need to understand that God spoke once and for all in the final age of the earth, before the great and coming kingdom of God, in the person of his Son. And he did not whisper in a still small voice. And if you really have turned to him, he's going to take the veil away from your understanding and he's going to allow you to see that. Verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now here's a detail for those who are awake. The Lord is the Spirit. What is that saying? Is it saying Jesus is the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, I think it is. <laughs> Okay, remember, exact representation of his divine nature. Okay, who's the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He's God. Okay, not a God, the God. There's a definite article used whenever, he, whenever God is mentioned. Okay, uh, is he separate from the Lord Jesus? Yes and no. <laughs> Um, add the Father and you have the triune God, who's both three and one, and three, but still one. You know, I'm not sure we as limited hu humans can actually figure this out, beloved. I'm not sure that we need to. It's plain and obvious that salvation comes through the Lord, and his name is Jesus, who sends the Holy Spirit, the great paraclete, a gift of the Father, to come alongside us for our aid. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Greek word may also be translated as freedom. In this sense, Jesus died to set us free from our slavery to sin. And he did set us free, regardless of the condition of the world. Yes, we are slaves. The word here in Greek is doulos, slave. Doula, we are slaves to Christ. But in our slavery to Christ, we are free of what was killing us. Sometimes quickly, sometimes agonizingly slowly. We are free indeed by the truth that he alone is. And there's more. Verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. You know, because Christ has set us free from the power of sin and the fear of death, we can see and know the truth. The world, and the Greek word here is cosmos, and its corrupt and evil system no longer has power over us. Okay, we can live freely as we were meant to live, serving Christ and his people. Does it really matter that the world hates us and eventually will want to be rid of us, really in the greatest slaughter of God's people of all time? No, because they cannot stop us. They cannot even slow us down in our service to Christ and his people. They Amen. cannot silence us. They're going to have to kill us to do that. And that, killing us, only does us a favor, if we're honest, because it sends us directly to be with Christ, says Paul in another place. Absent in the body, present with the Lord. By the way, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, and we're going to look at it in a couple of weeks. How long does that take? I don't know. Okay, but I don't think we can rely on the testimony of those who are marketing heaven tourism material or so-called prophets like, oh, say, Kat Kerr and her pink hair. Okay, by the way, I think she needs some professional psychological help for the delusion, delusions she speaks every, every week on Wednesdays. Medication or something, really. Um, I know the truth isn't coming from her. Okay, uh, that much is sure. Uh, you know, there was a boy who supposedly died and came back with the story that he'd been to heaven and seen Jesus. That boy's name is Alex Malarkey. What an unfortunate last name, right? <laughs> That's a lot of malarkey. Um, you know, when he was six, he and his dad were in a horrific car accident. 
um, that basically left uh, Alex a quadriplegic um, and in a coma for two months with various and multiple serious spinal injuries. Um, through what I think is a series of coaching-like statements, his dad got him to say that he died and went to heaven and then came back. I personally think that it was for the money initially to pay for the hospital bills. But, you know, things start for one reason and then often continue for other reasons. And a book deal was born with Tyndale Publishers and it pretty quickly became a bestseller. Um, however, at age 17 or 18, anyway, it was 2015, Alex repudiated his story um, publicly. His mom stood by him. His dad did not. Um, there was a small war in the family. The dad left. But Alex and his mom are actual Christians. Um, I've actually had the privilege of calling them both friends since about 2018. Uh, in fact, because Lifeway, the Southern Baptist Convention teaching wing, refused to quit selling the book, Alex turned to us at what was then pulpit and pen and asked us to help to get the word out. And we did. <laughs> and, and Lifeway has never recovered economically uh, mm -hmm. to, to the point where they had to close all their brick and mortar locations. Um, you know, but really it was for decreasing interest in book learning, according to Lifeway. And it didn't have anything mm -hmm. to do with the public spanking of a heresy peddler. No, mm -hmm. no. It was apparent that the same 15 angry Calvinists made all the complaints. It was, according to then President Ed Stetzer, no big deal. <laughs> you know what, though? Their leaked uh, emails, and they were leaked to Pulpit and Pen, uh, said differently, and we published those letters too, by the way. So, um, but back to Paul, Paul's point, okay? We can, in reality, not fake news that passes for reality. Uh, sorry. We can look on the real Jesus in reality, not the fake news that passes for reality, which is carefully crafted in back rooms all over the world. But in real truth, we can look upon the real Jesus. But we still don't have a full representation of his glory. You know, the New American Standard says, Beholding as in a mirror. The King James says, Through a glass, darkly. It is darkened, probably for our protection. Our human abilities are, are not enough at present to grasp the full reality, I think. Um, but even though we cannot see it, we are being transformed into that image that we look at through the metaphorical mirror of the Word of God, where we see Christ and follow our in our own limited capacity. <clears throat> and this, says Paul, is from the Lord, the Spirit. It is the will of God. And it is amazing. You know, when I really dissect a chapter like this, where I see the Gospel so clearly, and I see where it's taking all believers, including me, though none of us deserve it. I'm simply amazed. I don't know what to say or how to respond, but to say thanks to God and worship Him in the reality that He has revealed to me personally. That's how we should all be in the face of Christ. Thankful and amazed at the undeserved glory into which we are being initiated and transformed by the will of God as those who have turned to Christ in repentance and faith. That's what I saw in the chapter. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have shown us so clearly that the new covenant is infinitely better than the old covenant, which, had a, which was filled with glory. O oh Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and how everything in the Old Covenant is fulfilled in Christ. And it is this Christ 
who is our Lord and our Master, and who has saved us from death and hell for eternity. Lord, we, we ask that as we turn to you in faith and walk with Christ daily, that you would continue to bring us on this journey forward so that one day we will be able to stand in your presence and worship before your throne. We ask in his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, just before we let everybody online go uh, on the live stream, I want to say that it is the duty of every Berean to study the scriptures daily to make sure of what's so. So until we meet again, which is tomorrow night, for our, uh, our book reading club, and we're in The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, Chapter 9 starting, we'll see you then. Lord bless you.